I am delighted and I feel very privileged to welcome and introduce Professor Alain Fischer, who will give the first lecture in this Congress. For those of you who might not know him at all, I propose a special session at lunchtime, as there is very much to say. More seriously and in short, Alain Fischer is professor in pediatric immunology. He is the director of Imogene Institute for Genetic Diseases based at Necker Hospital in Paris. Imogene is a research and innovative healthcare institute for a new type, of a new type, bringing together researchers, doctors, and patients with a common goal to cure genetic diseases. Pro Professor Alain Fischer also holds the chair of experimental medicine at Collège de France in Paris. His talk is about new frontiers in primary uh, immunodeficiency. What have you learned? What should we expect? This is a long trip and we have a lot to discover. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin, for this kind introduction and thank you for the staff of IPOP for inviting me to this place to which I have some uh, personal connections. I'm, uh, I'm doubly pleased to be here to discuss with you, to overview, uh, of course, shortly the different aspects of, of primary immunodeficiencies. Um, I have the privilege, shared with a few people in the room, to be now quite old in the field. I think we are, I was just thinking, who else apart me is, is a senior person. I think there are two others, uh, Hans Ox and Amos Etzioni. We, we are the, the old guys here. And so we have experienced over the last uh, 40 years, something like that, the dramatic changes that have occurred in the knowledge, understanding, treatment of primary immunodeficiencies. If I go back, when I was a resident, I, I trained with Claude Griselli, who was uh, the, the person who introduced the field of primary immunodeficiencies in France. Uh, that what we knew about primary immunodeficiencies, this is 1977, so you know, we knew, of course, uh, that, um, is there a pointer? Yeah, that's the pointer, I guess. Yes. We knew that um, stem cells in the bone marrow are producing the, the cells of the immune system, so the leukocytes, only the lymphocytes are shown here. At that time, we knew about B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, we knew that there were agamma globulinemia, hypogamma globulinemia, common variable immunodeficiency in adults, uh, severe combined immunodeficiencies, Dijon syndrome, and a few other diseases, but not that much. And of course, the things have changed. If I just take a small part of primary immunodeficiencies, these are primary T cell immunodeficiencies, and only those that affect molecules that are uh, labeled in red on, on this complicated uh, cartoon. Don't uh, try to look at all of the details, of course. Uh, this is showing signaling from the receptor for antigen, which is here, the T cell receptor, and there are complex pathways that go to the nucleus and induce the production of important molecules for immune responses. So you can see that many of these molecules have been found to be defective in given primary immunodeficiencies. So this is now becoming complicated, and of course this is only a small part of the history. So what I would like to try to review with you uh, over the next minutes are several aspects, if I have time, if not we'll stop at some time, uh, about the scope, the number of patients, number of diseases, how do we diagnose the disease, pathophysiology, treatment, screening, and remaining challenges. The clinical scope of, of primary immunodeficiencies, of course everybody knows uh, that essentially primary immunodeficiencies lead to vulnerability to microbes, uh, bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi. It could be very broad, like in severe combined immunodeficiency, and sometimes restricted to a single pathogen. Uh, I have no, go, no time to discuss it in details, but let's consider it on a broad way. Uh, let's consider an elephant, and this is a mammal like us, and this elephant has many places, the surface of, of the skin, as well as internal cavities where microbes uh, can uh, deeply um, insert and cause problems if the immune system doesn't work well. The, and this is the same with us. I just remind you that we have, as adults, approximately two square meters of skin, 130 meter, square meters uh, of the surface of uh, epithelia in the lung, 300 square meters of surface of epithelia in the gut, and they are potentially all uh, in contact with microbes. And actually, physiologically speaking, we know that there are something that 10 to the 14th bacteria in some places of the gut, and even more viruses in our body. 
So we are normally peacefully living in, in collaboration, in conjunction with these microbes, but of course, when the immune system doesn't work properly, as it is the case in primary immunodeficiencies, this balance is disturbed, leading to infections, but also to inflammation. And by the way, the elephant, let's consider the African elephant, has the problem multiplied by 100, since uh, his weight, body weight is something like 7,000 kilograms. Okay, the, there are not only infections. This was already mentioned and will be discussed later this morning. Many of these patients, of these PIDs, they are also, in addition to infections, uh, being are also susceptible to autoimmunity, inflammation, as well as allergy. Just a few figures taken from the French registry Seredi of primary immunodeficiencies uh, from a study which is ongoing, not yet uh, completed. But, uh, the first 1,900 patients analyzed. We observe that a bit more than one uh, quarter of them have at least one autoimmune and or inflammatory manifestation. 19% have at least one allergic manifestation and a bit more than 5% have both. So this is very significant. This can lead to difficulties in diagnosis since this could be the very first clinical manifestation of a PID. Of course, there is a kind of pathophysiological paradox. I have no time to discuss here, but will be discussed later. It is a therapeutic challenge because many of these diseases require, uh, these complications require immunosuppression, which is not, of course, something we are uh, seeking to do uh, in patients with immunodeficiencies, and this is impacting on the prognosis. Just to illustrate this, in a cohort of patients with T cell primary immunodeficiencies, kinds of autoimmune manifestations or inflammations that can be found, very often autoimmune cytopenias, 60% of them, but you can see a long list of other manifestations that can occur in patients with primary immunodeficiencies. So these are only T cell immunodeficiencies, but of course you know that these autoimmune manifestations can occur in other settings. Uh, unfortunately, cancer is also a complication of primary immunodeficiencies. Just to give you uh, uh, um, some figures, again, taken from the work performed uh, with the French registry, Seredi, among, uh, at the time of analysis here, among 4,600 patients with a primary immunodeficiency, 262, so something like 5.6% have developed a cancer. As you can see here, mostly these are non-Hodgkin lymphomas, but also some form of solid tumors uh, can appear. There are some diseases uh, for which the risk is higher. The highest one is associated with ataxia telangiectasia, but there are other immunodeficiencies, unfortunately, where such complications can occur. There are multiple mechanisms. I have no time to review. We know about how an immunodeficiency can lead to a cancer or can be associated to a cancer. And of course, it's a therapeutic challenge, but at least in some occasions, it is possible to cure these cancer in, in these patients. And in addition to direct complications of primary immunodeficiencies, we should not forget about the fact that several of the genetic disorders that are leading to primary immunodeficiencies are also causing associated features that are not directly related to the immune system. Uh, I will show you a very complicated table. You are unable to read it, but just the uh, what I, the message I'd like to mention is that we as doctors uh, and caretakers of patients with PIDs, we, are, we should not forget about these many manifestations affecting the skin, the bone, uh, the teeth, the, the, uh, the gut, the kidney, the, the, the brain, and so on, because it is helping for diagnosis, but more importantly, this is important for the care of these patients to also consider these complications. So the next question is how many patients? Uh, still today we do not know. We have data in France that are starting to be quite comprehensive, though not yet fully. But again, the French registry has now registered 5,600 patients. You see here the, recruit the recruitment of patients. And you see on the right-hand side of this slide the prevalence, the distribution among France in the different regions. There is some heterogeneity, but it is becoming now more and more homogeneous with an overall prevalence of these days of seven patients alive among 100,000 pa individuals living in France, with half of them being children and half of them being adults. So we may estimate from the recent data, this is just a rough estimation, that the real incidence, at least in France, of PIDs is something of one case in 3,000 live births. Of course, 
this frequency is very, will, will vary very much as a function of the structure of the population and especially of the consanguinity rate if you consider that many of these inherited disorders are transmitted with autosomal recessive inheritance. Okay, how many diseases? Uh, if we consider uh, the, the genes behind the diseases, at least today we are close to 300. Uh, Capucine Picard was very kind to give me her slide where she put uh, the, uh, the kinetics by which genes have been identified as a cause of primary immunodeficiency over the time. So in black is the total curve and you see the, the diseases with the different types of transmission. Interestingly, the identification of autosomal dominant disorders is now increasing for clear-cut reasons based on the advances in genomics. So we are close to 300, but it is very likely not the end because if you consider that there are at least something like 2,000 genes that are particularly expressed and associated with immune responses, uh, there may be more very rare immunodeficiencies to be characterized, although not all of these genes will be affected because of redundancy. There are other genes that are regulatory, even because coding for RNA instead of protein, such as RMRP, which is the, um, the defective RNA causing uh, cartilage hair hypoplasia, for instance. There will be more and more identification, which is more complex, but of mutations in non-coding regulatory elements of the genome, uh, in sequences named enhances. And of course, there are probably, certainly, I would say, some non-monogenic PIDs. I am, of course, referring to common variable immunodeficiencies where the genetic situation is obviously much more complex. So this brings me to diagnosis. And diagnosis has made major advances over the last 10, 20 years. And research because we have access now to these machines and the technology of next generation sequencing with very high um, uh, throughput uh, by which we can have access to the sequence of DNA. There are some examples of the machines we are using at the Imagine Institute in Paris. And we have access to bioinformatic tools. I'm of course, not going to describe in details what is written here on this slide, but the development of many softwares uh, that are the ones we are using again in Paris uh, that are helping us uh, to decipher when there are variations in the genome, which, which of these variations are significant and can indeed cause an immunodeficiency. This is a challenge and it will be still a challenge for in the future for accurate diagnosis, so it's very important to consider that bioinformatics is now a part of our activities, both in research as well as in diagnostic activities. So the genetic diagnosis of PID, I think, is now changing. I'd like to explain it in a bit of detail. Yesterday, and I would say still today, uh, in most of the places, the way we proceed for diagnosis, of course, is to start with clinical symptoms and a potential family history in a patient. We do perform immunological tests uh, that are more and more sophisticated. We are uh, leading to a potential diagnosis hypothesis and leading to the sequencing of so-called candidate genes, such as BTK, if this is a boy with agammaglobinemia, for instance. Uh, but this procedure takes time in terms of genetic analysis. It's very costly if you don't find on the very first um, test what is the gene uh, involved. And there are multiple failures. So this procedure cannot be looked at satisfactory. Tomorrow, and st still ta starting today, the, the procedure will be different. Of course, starting with the same uh, clinical manifestation, family history, immunological test. And then there are two possibilities. Either there is a strong hypothesis, like XLA, again, boy with gamma globinemia, and there is no reason to change the way to proceed. But in any other case, and there are many, where there are no such obvious hypotheses, or at least there are may, maybe several genes that may be mutated, the way to proceed will be to use diagnostic, diagnostic gene panel based on next generation sequencing, where you can directly assess the DNA from a patient uh, to see whether he has genetic variations in any of the genes that have been known to be associated with primary immunodeficiencies. And there are several of such panels that are developed throughout the world. In, in Paris, Capucine Picard has developed such a panel which is now containing more than 270 genes. And it is quite uh, efficient to quickly now identify uh, immunodeficiencies, sometimes with surprises. So when a, a variation is detected, it has to be validated by the classic, classical way of sequencing and there is no variation found, then we can still go with the sequencing of exome, which is providing some more diagnosis, and why not, and this is now, of course, research, whole, whole ex, uh, genome sequencing. 
this procedure as being validated these days is much more rapid, much less costly, and much more efficient. So this is really the future where we are going uh, to diagnose primary immunodeficiencies. In Capucin Picard's experience in Paris, uh, applied to a certain set of patients, uh, the, sec the preliminary results show a success rate of this approach in a bit more than half of the patients. So this is really a, a significant change and is going to be very useful. So why do we need genetic diagnosis? How, what for? There are several re good reasons to uh, go to a precise diagnosis of primary immunodeficiencies. Very first an obvious uh, reason is to give a name to the disease. Of course, this is not sufficient to, to, to treat a patient, but this is important to have a precise diagnosis. Uh, it's very much, I'm sure you, are, you are, will agree with me, it is very much appreciated by the patients themselves and their families. So by per se, this is important. Then, of course, one having identified a mutation in a given gene may help, not always, but it's a step forward uh, understanding the pathophysiology of the disease, which is important for treatment. If I have time, I will briefly mention why. Uh, it is helping to better assess the prognosis, since at least for some of the primary immunodeficiencies, there is some correlation between uh, the mutation and the phenotype, so the expression of the disease. So there are some mutations that lead to a complete absence of a protein, which are usually more severe in clinical consequences than mutations where some residual activity is left. This is not always the case, but it is helping. This is, uh, the, the diagnosis may help to design, based on pathophysiological studies, uh, to design targeted therapies, and I will briefly mention them at the end of my talk. And obviously, uh, this is helping for genetic counseling for affected patients, and maybe, eventually, in the future, we might use these informations for screening, global screening of genetic disorders of the immune system, but we are not yet there. So at least, the message is that it is important as much as we can for that, that every single patient with a primary immunodeficiency, um, for every one of them, there is an attempt to identify the gene and the mutation. So understanding pathophysiology, of course, I'm not going to review what do we know about the many primary immunodeficiencies, just to remind you with a few figures that among, for instance, the most frequent forms of PIDs, B cell immunodeficiency, so antibody production deficiency, there are several groups of diseases that have now been identified. I will not review them, of course, for sake of time, but we know more and more uh, at which stage during B cell development or B cell function such or such gene is causing a block in antibody production, global or partial. Same uh, with T cell immunodeficiencies. Here you see uh, in the, uh, the rectangles of different colors several primary immunodeficiencies that affect T cells and that may affect a certain pathway of effective functions or regulatory functions leading to different forms of diseases, infections, or to immunity, uh, inflammation, lymphoproliferation, and so on. So we know these things better and better, so there are still advances to be made. If we go to the most severe forms, the severe combined immunodeficiencies, it will be reviewed in more detail this afternoon by Bobby, but we know a bit better how uh, block in T cell development lead to an absence of T lymphocytes. And finally, among uh, deficiencies of innate immunity, so everything else which is not T and B lymphocytes, this is a very important part of the immune system to fight infections, bacteria, fungi, as well as viruses. We know more and more of these diseases, only a few are shown here, but those we, you are aware of, like severe congenital neutropenia in blue with a block in development of neutrophils, or CGD on the uh, right top hand side, chronic granulomatous disease, where polymer neutrophils as well as macrophages do not properly produce uh, radical oxygen species and can't kill well bacteria and fungi and more others. I will not go into details, but we know many more uh, of these diseases and their pathophysiology these days. So this is brings, bringing me to treatments. Uh, based on these advances in understanding the diseases, we are making progress, although there are still a lot of progress to be made in how to treat these many primary immunodeficiencies. And there are many aspects of treatment of primary immunodeficiencies, from supportive care to curative treatment. I have, of course, no time to review all of these aspects, but I know that along the, the, these two days of the meetings, many of um, these different topics in terms of therapy will be covered by several speakers. 
supportive care, usually we don't speak too much about supportive care, but this is extremely important, and especially for those who have the severe forms of primary immunodeficiencies, we have to think very seriously about it, and notably about nutrition, which is very important to maintain the global status of these patients so can, they can go through other forms of treatment. Anti-infectious treatments are, of course, very important, not only curative of infections, but also prevention, and there are new classes of drugs that have been developed to treat fungal infections and viral infections, for instance, and of course this is not the end. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, we sometimes have to use immunosuppressive drugs in patients with PIDs. We have to, and this is leading to some problems, so we have to think very carefully about it. Of course, immunoglobulin substitution is a major, major aspect of treatment of primary immunodeficiencies. I will not review it now, but everybody knows about it. And then there are the curative treatments, stem cell therapy, gene therapy, and targeted therapy. I will briefly discuss it. Let's start with stem cell therapy. As you know, uh, in 1968, so 47 years ago, um, Bob Good and Fritz Back uh, firstly reported the successful treatment of primary immunodeficiencies by allogenic bone marrow transplantation. Bob Good for a patient with severe combined immunodeficiency, Fritz, Fritz Back for a patient with the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. And these are the very first patients who ever have been successfully treated by allogenic bone marrow transplantation far before uh, patients with leukemias, for instance, have been successfully treated. So everything in bone marrow transplantation started with primary immunodeficiencies and then was expanded to the treatment of more frequent diseases. As you know very well, this is based on a very strong rationale in that within our bone marrow, uh, there are the cells, this is the factory producing all of the blood cells, and we have stem cells with self-renewal capacity, so if we inject, stem cells from a healthy donor to a recipient with a primary immunodeficiency, it may lead to the reconstitution of a normal immune system, whatever it's a defect of adaptive immune responses, T lymphocytes mostly, or innate immune responses, granulocytes and macrophages. So the rationale is very strong, and since 1968, many patients have benefited from stem cell transplantation um, all over the world in the field of PIDs, I tried to make an estimation, I'm sure this is wrong, but at least it is an order of magnitude of, the, of primary immunodeficiencies that have now been cured by stem cell transplantation. And I, I reached the figure of 80, I'm sure there are more, and you can see that there are several types of immunodeficiencies from SCID, KID, combined immunodeficiencies, HLH, hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis, autoimmune primary immunodeficiencies, autoinflammatory ones. And in, in, in Europe, we have a, a registry since 1985, which is collecting most of the transplanted patients. And there are now more than 4,000 patients registered, which is extremely helpful to assess the results and how we make progress, as you will see, in this treatment. And there are advances. There are many reasons why there has been advances. We transplant the patients earlier because of better diagnosis, so they are less well affected um, by the uh, immunod immunodeficiency and their consequences. There is a better donor choice, I have no time to go into detail, better preparation, but this will be discussed uh, this afternoon. There are improved strategies to perform allergenic stem cell transplantation even when, when a donor is not fully matched for the HLA system. Improved supportive care, and we are doing better because we gained experience in the different specialized centers taking care of these patients all over the world. A few examples of advances taken from the registry, the European registry. Here are the results of tra patients transplanted for the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. So this is survival uh, 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 as a function of time, up to eight years, for patients transplanted between 2006 and 2013. And you can see that the overall results are pretty good since uh, the, the, the chance of success is 100% if the patient has an actually identical sibling, 90% if there is a match un uh, unrelated donor, and close to eight, more than 80%, even more than 80% uh, with an um, aplo identical donor. So this is significant advance compared to what we did 30 years or 20 years ago. Another example taken uh, from the study led by uh, Typhoon Gunger in Zurich about chronic granulomatous disease. This is a a report he published last year in the Lancet. This is the survival of patients who were transplanted for chronic granulomatous disease in many centers 
in different places in the world. And you, you see here uh, overall survival, even free survival as a function of donor type. I have no time to go into the detail, but you see that all of the curves are, are the same. So the chance of success in this cohort of patients uh, in terms of survival, at least uh, for five years, is something like more than 80%, which is remarkable advances compared to the early days of transplant for CGD, which makes that this is probably more and more suitable for allogenic stem cell transplantation, at least if there is a good donor. This is about stem cell therapy. Of course, many other aspects could be discussed and will be discussed, I'm sure, this afternoon. Gene therapy. Gene therapy has entered the field of primary immunodeficiencies and actually gene therapy has been first applied to primary immunodeficiencies, a little bit like allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in the past. Again, the rationale is strong because if one is able to modify the genetic, uh, the genome of the stem cells in the, in the bone marrow by adding or modifying a gene that is mutated and causing an immunodeficiency, the autologous transplantation of these modified stem cells uh, should be able to correct the immunodeficiency. That's the principle. And as you know, this has now been applied in a few centers in the world. Just one example of the principle for one of the diseases that has been treated, severe combined immunodeficiency that is X-linked, X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency. These patients, as you can see here, have no T cells and no NK cells. So the principle is to do ex vivo gene transfer into stem cells or early progenitors so that there is a correction of the development of T and NK cells marked with the blue rectangle, which is a symbol of the, of the added normal copy of the gene that is mutated in patients. So the way it is done is to take the bone marrow from the affected child and to, mod to select the cells, to culture them and to infect them with the virus which is bringing the, the normal copy of the gene into the precursor cells of the bone marrow and to re-inject these cells to the patient after one to three days as a function of the protocol that is being used. With a little bit more details, here are the data for, for x linked skid As an example, the gene is named gamma C. So this is the virus, which is named a retrovirus because this genetic material is made of RNA and this RNA is retrotranscribed into DNA, into the cells that are infected by the virus, and that this DNA is able, at least in some circumstances, to integrate into the genome of the cell, so that now it's there, it, had, it can encode the, the gene of interest, and the, the messenger RNA of that gene may uh, encode, be translated into the protein expressed and potentially correcting the disease. And Bobby Gascar will, will review this afternoon in more details, um, the data that have been obtained. So just in summary today, there are three primary immunodeficiencies that, have, that in some places in the world have been efficiently treated by gene therapy, SCID-X1, adenosine deaminase SCID, as well as the wiscott aldrich syndrome. There are, today there are more than 100 patients, a little bit more than 100 patients, who have been successfully treated with a sustained efficacy since 1999. So which is encouraging and leading to many or more projects that are being developed for other primary immunodeficiencies. You have a list here which is not exhaustive. And these, these studies, and this is important to be mentioned, are based on international collaboration that is extremely active and I think this is very good. Uh, also, of course, everyone is aware of the risk associated with gene therapy and the safety issues. In the early trials, uh, there were issues of leukemias uh, that were induced by the first generation of viruses that were used with a high risk of leukemias. But the good news is that in recent trials performed for immunodeficiencies and a few other diseases of the bone marrow, no such uh, events have occurred. And this is, of course, indicating that the new vectors we are using, the so-called SYN vectors, Bobby will describe to you after this afternoon what they are, uh, are much safer. And of course, this is very good news for the future. Uh, I will skip that in order not to be too long. And, uh, and to say a few words to another topic of major interest these days in the context of treatment of primary immunodeficiencies, which is targeted therapy. I mentioned earlier that today we know much better, not completely, but much better, the pathophysiology of many of the primary immunodeficiencies. We know the, the, the genes, the protein, and in which pathway the protein is involved. So in some occasions, this is leading us uh, to uh, identify targets, therapeutic targets, 
and, and drugs that can be used to correct the immunodeficiency. I will mention a few examples, starting with the very old one, IgG substitution. It's a beautiful targeted therapy. Patients have a defect in, in IgG production, so we are just adding back the product that is missing. This is clear. This is not curative, but as you know very well, extremely effective in protecting patients against infections. It went to uh, substitution for the patients with adenosine deaminase by adding the, back the enzyme that is missing. This is uh, also at least partially uh, relieving the, the manifestations, I guess Bobby will discuss it this afternoon, of patients with um, adenosine deaminase deficiency. And now in a more recent um, uh, era, some other treatments have been defined. For instance, there are uh, disease, primary immunodeficiencies that cause selective risk of HSV herpes simplex virus encephalitis. This is the work of the group of Jean-Laurent Casanova. And in, in these uh, patients, there are defects in a pathway that is leading to the production of interferon alpha. So such patients could be treated with interferon alpha. Uh, same for patients with susceptibility to mycobacter infections. Some of them are lacking gamma interferon, so many of them, not all, can be uh, um, significantly uh, relieved uh, with their bad infections by treatment with gamma interferon. Uh, blocking cytokines when there is inflammation or autoimmunity may be helpful. IL-1 inhibitors are used in auto-inflammatory syndromes, which are part of genetic disorders of the immune system. Inhibitors of interferon type 1 for another group of disease named Eckardi gutierrez syndrome, and gamma interferon inhibitors may be of interest to treat patients with HLH. But there are more, and I will not go into the detail of these slides, just to see that here you have six examples of rare disorders of the immune system with bizarre names, TTC7A deficiency, CTLA4 deficiency, APDS, and so on. These are um, immunodeficiencies causing infections and inflammation as well as autoimmunity uh, that have been uh, described and understood recently for which there is today, or there will be soon, a drug that can be used at least to attenuate the symptoms. And this is very encouraging, and it can be very simple molecules. Let's look, look at the last one, X-Men, the MACT1 deficiency, uh, reported by people of the NIH. Uh, there is a problem in the transport of magnesium, so just by giving to these patients high dose of magnesium, this may help them. So sometimes it could be simple, we'll see in the future, but I'm sure there will be more of on this category. To finish with, just to say one word about screening, which is, of course, is going to be very important. As you know, it started in the field of severe combined immunodeficiencies, and this is based on the fact that stem cell transplantation for patients with SCID is doing extremely well if the patient at the time of transplant is infectious free. Again, these are data, <coughs> excuse me, from the, the European registry. You see that most of the patients who have been transplanted, uh, at least in the recent period of time, without infections, there are patients since 2000, are alive, thank you, whereas patients infected uh, because of their immunodeficiency, so treated much later in their life, so later means five, six months, not uh, that late, uh, are doing much less well. So obviously if we can uh, diagnose all of these children before the time they have an infection, this is a significant uh, advance in the chance of cure of such patients. And as you know, uh, the, the newborn screening for SCID has been developed in the U.S. Now it is implemented in most of the U.S. states, as shown here. Several million babies have been screened by the so-called TREC assay performed uh, at, at birth. Uh, it works very well, and uh, the, the name of Jennifer Puck needs to be mentioned because she's the, the one who designed the assay and implemented the first studies, and this was supported by the Jeffrey Model Foundation. So the other countries, countries are now moving towards uh, implementing uh, the newborn screening. Uh, it takes time. Uh, there are advances in Europe and other countries, I know. I hope that soon, many, in many, many places, uh, this will be uh, in place. So to finish with, I'd like to have a few conclusions and challenges to mention. I think the very first challenge we have, and it's a difficult one, but I think this is the most important one, is that worldwide there is an adequate care proposed to patients with primary immunodeficiencies. Of course, it requires a huge effort, but we have to, to work on it. Of course, networks, training, and the role of patients' associations are key to move toward that direction. 
Uh, newborn screening, I hope, will be, as I just mentioned, implemented for skids everywhere, or at least many countries. But of course, we have to think of newborn screening for other diseases where early intervention is required, so again, to uh, save lives. This is the case of other T cell primary immunodeficiencies, HLH, leukocyte adhesion deficiency, and a few others. So we have to work on that. There are ways to, to think about it. The development of targeted therapies is important, I mentioned it, as well as the one of gene therapy. We have to be aware uh, that patients, even those who were cured from their immunodeficiency, have to be assessed on the, long on the long term, so for their whole life, I would say, because there may be sequelae from the consequences of the immunodeficiency, and they may have, as I mentioned, non-immune manifestations we have to recognize and treat. This is also very important. Uh, the transition uh, of the medical care for children to the medical care of adults is a challenge, it, you know, as you know, in so, for some of the patients, and we have to pay very much attention to this transition. But of course, also we have to take care of the patients not have, having only an immunodeficiency, but uh, this is an individual with his problems and the consequences of the disease. So all of the psychosocial uh, consequences of the disease have to be considered, and this is not that easy, I have to say. And obviously, we collectively have to continue uh, to do our best to improve the knowledge to, to perform research in these many, many directions. And I will finish to say that in Paris, uh, we are trying to do that, and the way to do it is actually to have a lot of good people working. And this, we have the chance to have in Paris a number of people, so you see the names here, clinicians and scientists who are doing this job and doing it very well, and they are doing it in collaboration with a number of people uh, internationally. I have no space and time to mention them, and of course in collaboration with the patients themselves and their families. And you need finally institutions, entities to support your activities, and this is just the list of, of uh, different kinds of organizations in France, Europe, and international that are supporting our activities in Paris. Thank you very much.